Okay, it looks like we're back at my good old desk here. And I'm finally going to get around to showing you guys the whole entire, explain the whole scripture of how to make your own binary counter right on your Raspberry Pi. Just like I got here, I already assembled it. Uh, as you can see, there's a sensor, but that's for another project, but that's actually hooked up to this. But it's actually for another project that I will do in the future. And that's why I got it hooked up. But for now, we got three little shift registers right there that you hardly ever see, but they're gonna run the entire Python program examples I'm gonna show you. And then what I'm about to show you is how you can make the LEDs count from binary from right to left, left to right, inverted left, inverted right. And uh, that just to show you the formula in case you wanna learn it because of other YouTube videos that would show how you do it, but they wouldn't show the programming on how you do it. That's the difference. Where I hope that I can actually bring this to everybody that might want to ever, that might have wanted to ever try to do this. It's easier than I even thought, but it took me about eight days to figure it all out when I first did it. So I'd like to share the program with you guys. Okay, as we were saying, I got 24, so I got seven blue LEDs on here. And along with uh, each one has a, a resistor, a 220 ohm resistor. And then I got this 10 LED graph bar. And I would have loved to use all LEDs for this demonstration, but I don't got a long enough breadboard to fit 24 LEDs. Well, I do, but they'll be crammed together and they don't look good. I had it set up like that. And we also got two buzzards. Now these buzzards, they're called active buzzards. I got two of them. Now they're tricky, they take five volts, but if you're gonna have them playing like a eh sound constantly, you have to put a resistor on them. If you don't, they seem to set, the audio seems to wanna get away, like as if it's gonna over amp or something. So what I do is, I don't have any resistors in here for those, so because they're such a, a, a light beep, I don't really need them. So you can, some things you don't need that you do need with electronics, but if you use certain only voltages or a certain limited time, uh, uh, minutes of a second, whatever, you're okay with it. But as for lights, no, you're not okay with that. They need resistors all the time. They can blow in seconds. But as for these uh, little buzzards, they're, they're okay, but they're a little unstable. If you want to play them really loud, you should have a resistor on them. Uh, maybe a 1K ohm. Something like that, but it'll change the sound a bit, but at least the sound won't try to get away. It sounds louder and louder and louder and makes you wonder what's going to go on. And we got those, and now the three shift registers. They're three 74 HC595 shift registers. They're eight bits each. And they're gonna make up this 24 bit number. But I only ain't gonna play the whole number. It'll take days to do that. So I'm just gonna show you how to make the formula to make all this stuff happen. But if you can set it up like the way I got this all set up, you're good to go. You know, if there's anything on this video that's not shown, you can find it on other videos on how to ship, on how to exactly hook up these ship registers. But on the, on my videos, I will have the display on pictures on how to actually hook these up. But if you're not sure, look at other videos, because uh, they'll show you how to hook them up, but they won't show you how to do the code to the binary, which I will show you. So if you need to watch two kinds of videos, I suggest you do that because there's people that can show you probably more than I even can. But I think I, I think I got some good stuff here to, to tantalize you guys for a while. But like I said, if there's other video sources you gotta look at of something I may not show in here, like all this already set up. I'm not showing you step by step how to set this up, but there are lots of videos out there that can take care of that for you. But this is the actual Raspberry Pi that's gonna run everything. And it's going to run the whole entire show. But right now, it's, I, I got it off. I don't need it on right now. Uh, okay, so there we have it. That's, that's today's homework. Here is the basic layout of a 74 HC595 shift register pinouts. These are all listed here. We'll start with the easiest pins to remember first. Pins 1 through 7, parallel data output pins, BH27. They start right from here all the way to down to here. They are where you're going to put all your magical LEDs that are going to light up. They're going to be all on here, and they're going to be attached to 220 ohm resistors each. 
Each one of these little LEDs that you're going to put here are going to have their very own resistor current flow. Now this one here, the ground at number 8, that is right down here. Okay, number 8 is the ground. And I got my you know, kind of a UE going to the same side as where I got my positive rail and my you know, my negative rail on the same side on the other on the right on the right side of the cobbler part of the Raspberry Pi breadboard layout the way I have my layout and then uh, number nine is the serial data output pin H7 and what this does this will make it so you can daisy chain other SIP registers uh, when, when you want to put two or more registers together this is what this is going to be for uh, and then uh, number 10 is your reset active low which is right here this here will take a, a positive uh, lead a little wire that goes here that's what that's where that will go right here uh, and this number number 11 is SRCLK uh, chip storage register clock pin SPI clock that would be number 11 right here that's where one of your inputs would actually plug into your Raspberry Pi this right here is one of your inputs right here and then pin 12 is RCLK STCP uh, shift register clock input data latch pin uh, that's number that'll be number 12 and that will also go to your Raspberry Pi. This will be attached to your Raspberry Pi also as the second wire that will be attached to it. And then we got the third pin, the 13th pin, uh, OE output enable active low. You, we keep this on a negative so it will cause it to flip flop. We want the circuit to flip flop. We don't want it to be powered, like on positive. We want it to be a flip flop so it's got to go to the negative part of the rail that's where that's going to go and then number 14 is sear ds serial data input spi data this here is also going to be on one of your ports this here will be one of your ports also on your raspberry pi this will hook up to your raspberry pi and then we got 16 the voltage positive voltage supply uh, VCC, I guess it's voltage current collector, but they call it positive voltage supply. That's right up here. That'll take another red lead going to your positive, your positive rail on your Raspberry Pi breadboard that you're using. Okay, here is the basic layout for one shift register, two shift registers, or three shift registers, which I'm only got right now. I don't got four, so I've only got three. Now, what I had done since I've had the shift uh, the shift registers I've been learning them for about seven months now I guess these here are your you know, I have to do it here these are your positive leads this goes to your your voltage supply for pin 16 this is your pin 10 right here this is your pin 10 supply right here uh, negative uh, positive uh, wire right here and this is the the flip-flop part of the, the shift register right here that stays currently on the ground low that's what that is and so this goes to ground too but I got mine bent in a U shape as you see on my live board but this is the basic layout of starting to activate the shift register giving it power but it's doing nothing yet as you see this here is a diagram of the same thing is think of these two shift registers as one but at the same time they're also laid out the exact same way as if they were only one each instead of actually two being as one which I'll explain as I go but right now these are just two ordinary shift registers that don't do nothing with each other yet at all but they got the power and everything ready to go they got the flip-flop ready to go and everything and here is the basic diagram of how you have them and as you can barely see because of the image the way it has zoomed in see these little tongue groove things here they have to go this direction if you want the shift registers to read from right to left 
which is easier to remember, put them in this way to my to the perspective you're seeing, into the same perspective that I have on my breadboard. Put them to the notches to the left, and that way you'll know your shift registers will go always from the right to the left. They are not universal shift registers I have here. They are just ordinary basic shift registers, eight bits each is all they are. So the, these are also the schematics underneath this. Even though you can't really see it here, but it's okay, I'm explaining it enough and you'll see it clearer in other pictures. This is just a basic layout of what I'm showing you here of what these things do. This this one here now is three shift registers. But notice how they got nothing to do with each other. There's nothing hooked up to interconnected at all. But they're all ready to go. They're all ready to rock. They're ready to be lit up. All we gotta do is put the power put the the leads to them to make them talk to the Raspberry Pi and everything and the lights. But this here is again, see how I got all my tongues to the left? That's because these here are exactly laid down to right to left for all the shift register count. So I got it exactly there. And this is here is what you can see close up of what we just talked about now. All your leads are going to go from here all the way to here. This is where all your fun is going to be right here. All your fun is going to go all along here starting from here. That's where your fun's going to be. And this is the shift register of what it looks like. On here, you really can't see the little tab, but it's right here. Always put that to your left if you want to know that your shift register is going to count correctly from right to left. Here is the basic shift register 1 hooked up to the Raspberry Pi. This here is the Raspberry Pi's 40, 40 pinout. This here has got 40 pinouts in it. Now, what I do, I, I, a video suggested, and I'm so glad I watched it. I'm not going to say who, but I'm just going to mention the video anyway. But he suggested I use a breadboard and a cobbler with the breadboard, and along, uh, along with ribbon cable, which actually did come with the Raspberry Pi. It came with actual ribbon cable that I'm using. So what I did is I bought an electronic kick that came with a, uh, a cobbler. And then I wanted to learn how to use the cobbler, and this video was the perfect one to learn from. That way you don't take a chance on breaking any pins, trying to put little tiny pin sockets into these. They're, they can be very tedious. They're tiny, tiny, little tiny pins, and you can, they, can, they can bend, and you don't want to bend them. So it's better to use a ribbon cable like I, use, like I have on mine. It's more safer. That way it only gets damaged, not these. You, you can afford a new ribbon cable or a cobbler or a breadboard, but a Raspberry Pi is expensive after a while. You don't want to do that. So that's what that's for, okay? I use a ribbon cable on here to run up, to run anything I do. But the same here again, more clear, the same basic layout of the shift register. I'm using one, and we got our voltage collector here. We got our flip-flop, always low. I call it a flip-flop because as long as it's low, it can keep counting the numbers. It won't stop. It's not supposed to stop, but it's supposed to clear and reset. And then I got my uh, number 10 uh, going to the three volt side too also. This is going to ground. This is your input output. The flip flop. Active low. Okay, now we got uh, that said. And over here is the ports, is what I was using at one time when I was first getting new to the Pi. That's why you see these little Raspberry Pis. But I'm always shifting pins around. So I'm not using these right now, but this is just the pin layout I kept for my Raspberry Pi so I know where everything is. And on the cobbler, it's five volts on the right side of the, on the left side of the cobbler, three volts on 3.3 volts on the right side of the cobbler. So, uh, that's the cobbler when it comes out of the ribbon, that perspective. Okay, that's where all that. That's how I got it laid out. Also, the way it's shown here, I also got it laid out that way on my cobbler. So everything's pretty much the way it is. If you were to use one shift register. And I'll explain it here. Pin 14, right here that you see here, it goes to one of the live ports on your Raspberry Pi through your breadboard. You don't need, you don't need a whole bunch of uh, little tiny pins to light up uh, 24 LEDs now. But you do need shift, three shift registers to be able to do that. But right now I'm showing you one for demonstration how, on how to hook it up. For one shift register, you take this little wire on pin 14, on your breadboard, put it right beside the pin where that little hole is, and then you run right along to your bread to whatever 
pin socket you want to use on your breadboard. And then you do the same thing with pin number 12 and pin number 11. That's if you want one only shift register only. You don't have to worry about daisy chaining anything. All you got to do is worry about these and these guys here. And then the rest of the fun that you can do is you got your lights starting from here all the way to here. Okay? Your whole eight LEDs. And it's going to start from Q0. And uh, as I showed you on the chart before, <laughs> it showed an a, A1 instead of an A0. But that, there, there's different kinds of reading these things. I just uh, didn't notice the, part, the bottom part of the other one. But they pronounce it as A or Q for all these. Mine is, is written as Q. Q0 all the way to Q7. Not A0 all the way to A7. But it still is the same kind of register no matter how you see it. As long as it says 74H... C595, this, that's all, that's good to go. As long as you know it's that. That's the actual model number of the, of the shift register itself. Here is the same kind of drawing as before image that you see. But this time I'm using two shift registers. And I've only had these for about seven or eight months since I've had my Pi. I've had my Pi for about a year and a half. But these guys are still fairly new to me, but I'm really getting to know them well. But when I first did the two pin, the two shift register layout, I didn't realize I could have took this, this physical yellow wire and put it down here like as, a, as in my new schematic show. This is doing the same thing, but what's happening here now is you got pin 14 going all the way down to pin 9 on here. You're going right to pin 9 that's going to daisy chain that. That's what causes the, 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 the shift register to be daisy chained. But each one of them have to have their own uh, voltage and stuff like I explained. Each one of them have to have their own things. But they can be interconnected now. Now what's happening here is I got pin 12 connected all the way to pin 12. See that? And then I got pin 11 on this shift register connected all the way to pin 11 on this one and then just like a subway you know you got an, up, an upper floor to get another train but you want to go the same way but only the first level couldn't go as far so now you got to climb up and go to the second level train well this is going to do the same thing this now is going to carry all this information to to uh to uh pin 11 and pin 12 and pin 11 and then we got the pin 14 that's going to read this because of all this here because of this this is going to read off this pin 14 and these guys are getting all the information all because of this daisy chain these blue guys are getting all the information because of that so this is this is the blue again that this pin 12 it's getting fired into this pin 12 this pin 11 is going to get fired into this pin 11 on here and then pin 11 and pin 12 and pin 11 on here are going to get fired into the Raspberry Pi along with this guy right here. So you, you only need three uh, uh, Raspberry Pi ports, three breadboard holes for all for, for 24 LEDs when I get to showing you three. But right now this is going to hold 16 LEDs. The other one could hold eight. This is going to hold 16. Just like before, you take your LEDs. It starts from here and it goes all the way to here. You just do the same here, as if it was a total different shift register altogether. You start putting your LEDs here, and they go all the way to here. And that's all you got to remember from there on, and the rest of all this will play all that. After you've got this all hooked up, you have fun, and you put your LEDs in, your, your LEDs in. But always use a 220 ohm resistor on each one, or you'll blow them right away if you don't. Now we're going to get out of here. Ah, this is my final Eureka layout right here. And the way I hooked up pin number two on the last layout was the evolution on this one here when I finally hooked up three, three shift registers. What I had done again, each shift register is going to have its own from zero to, to seven, its own little LEDs on each one, eight, 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 and eight weeks, 24, 24 LEDs. And they're all independently hooked up. They're all independently hooked up. And the only thing that's causing them to do this now 
is now pin 14 is now going to go into pin 9 on here. Pin 14 on, on here is going to go all the way to pin 9 down here. And then the pin 12 and 11 are going to feed and daisy chain into pin 12 and 11 on here. And then pin 11 and 12, pin 12 and 11 on here are going to feed back into pin 12 and 11 on here. And eventually go back into uh, only three ports again. Between the, the between all these bits, there's only going to be three pins again. No matter how many shift registers you use, you're only going to have three input, three I/O input uh, I/O uh, pins that you're going to use. That's all you're going to had to have to need between 24 bits. That lets that light up. All right, this is the last image here. I'm going to show you. That's the icing on the cake. This here is where all the fun begins. After you did all the homework and all the hard work of getting everything going, now these little triangles here that you see, they represent little drawings of little LEDs I made. That way they're fun to look at and you can actually see exactly what's going on here. We already discussed of what all these other pins do. Now just so you know and you actually can see to remember, like I said on some shippers or drawings, they call QA. Okay, I don't know why they do that, but they do. Okay, I'm using I'm using Q0 to Q7, not A0 to A7. So that one little schematic I showed you, uh, I should have changed it to their A to a Q, but it still did the same thing, like I, I said. Now all the fun begins here, but you must put a 220 ohm resistor on each of these LEDs. You have to do that, or the LEDs will blow, and it could also hurt your shift registers too. So make sure you have... 220 ohm resistors on each of these eight LEDs. It starts from zero all the way to seven. Okay, and that way you can start having your fun making your your shift registers do anything you want. Okay, as we got here, this is this here is translated back into the ordinary Python shell that comes with your Python download and stuff like that when you install it. So what I had done is I put the whole entire Raspberry Pi lead program into here even though this wouldn't run it but at least it's preservable code and it's easier to show you on here than it is on a tiny tiny screen i don't want to show you this on a tiny screen it's a headache but i always start with what the title of the program is called followed by my name and this little note here i made up i wanted to be very careful of how i was going to show people how to do this because it's it can be dangerous if you don't know what you're doing and it could also be more dangerous for your equipment breaking down if you don't know what you're doing. So I always have a little tiny tip like this, be mindful of playing with electronics. And then we got the items needed and these are the items that are gonna be needed. I, I always say jumper wires on this 36 or more because I'm not sure of the actual count after I do all this, but I always have two extra ones for the Raspberry Pi 4 fan. And then up here, you need your one Raspberry Pi. That equals one. You need your breadboard or one or more, depending on what you want to do with them. You know, you want you might have two or three of them you might like. And then you got your 74H, HC595 shift registers. You want three of those. And then we got two active buzzards. And then we got your bar graph which is actually 10 LEDs. I just didn't put that here, but it's called a bar graph. I assume it's always 10 LEDs anyway. So you got one here, and you got 14 blue LEDs, seven on each side, which I did forget to mention in the part of that video when I said seven LEDs, I meant to say seven on each side because I can't fit 24 LEDs on a small breadboard unless I cram them together and they don't look good, which I already had explained. And now on down here, that's why I already explained what the two jumper wires for your Raspberry Pi 4 fan. And then I explained what this program allows users to do. And we're going to be using the breadboard method over the VCOM method because, uh, Broadcom method, because uh, the GPIO breadboard method is the actual pinouts. So that way, the actual pinouts, you'll know where they are no matter where they're situated on certain pin, pin layouts and stuff. So I read, I've, I've been learnt off other videos from such, and so I learnt, I learnt a lot of stuff from other people. But all this homework is my own homework here. It took a while to understand it, and it took about eight days or more to crack this particular code 
for doing what I wanted to do to show you with ledge counting and binary. Now, here's the tricky part here. When you get down to making your latch, all depending how you hooked your figure, your physical wires up to your shift registers, to your, your GPIO ports, which is only three, I got my wires in the exact same order my drawings are. So the wires are nice ordered, but they came out to be 35, 37, 33. If I was to switch these numbers around, it won't work. These numbers have to be exactly one above the other in the exact order they are because Python seems to want to read from the top word downward. That's how it actually executes its programming too, from the top down, and it, and as well as we list it that way. It, just, it, it executes exactly the way it's listed. It's just pretty much the way it is. It's what object-oriented programming really is, really, that and functions. But this, these here are, have to be laid out exactly. But use your own de desired bits. You don't have to use uh, the pin 35 or pin 37 or pin 33. It can be any pins you want to use. But if you if you use pins and they don't work right away, switch the order of your programming till you got the pins where you want them to be. And when you got when you see your LEDs come on, you know you got the right sequence. So I first I tried a, a 37 and 35 and 33. That didn't work. Then I tried 37, 33, 35, that didn't work. And then when I finally tried 35, 37, and 33, that worked. They were, because they were, the, these are the pins I'm using, but they have to be in the exact order they are, or it won't work. Now this here is because it's a 24-bit number. This here says 16,777,215. We want this to actually go up to 16 million uh, 70, 7,077, 216, where it's just up by one, and this is the least most significant bits that will do the same. They take the next bits downward from the largest ones. As you can see, it's 8,388,607, uh, and then we got this one here that says uh, 8,388,608, the same thing here. But what I had done here now, now we're getting into this part here where we want to make the shift bit uh, data bits work and come on. So we got this control shift data bit. I made a variable to make things shorter. Data bit, latch bit, and clock bit. So these are here is what these are. And then I, what I had done here is I made a clear out where I shut all the bits off. So the program starts with nothing on it. And then when the show gets going, the bits will start to light up here where I have it saying binary bits default for the first function. And this here, the binary bits default, will show you how normal binary bits work. And then as we go down, I will show you another segment of how the bits look like they're inverted. They, they're, the, all the bits are on, except that the ones that turn off, they're the ones that do in the counting, in which you will actually see visual representations of this. I will not just show you the programming of this, I will also show you the visual videos of what this all does. Now, this word I, B, B means binary. You need to put this here, and uh, for this here, because we're doing bits inverse, if you want to do a bits inverse, normally the, the, the sign bit, which is here, would be up here, and that wouldn't be here, that'd be here. But because we're gonna do bits inverted, that's gonna be down here instead. Yeah, you'll you'll see what I mean, but this here is a sign bit. Every one every one of these uh, uh, binary trick uh, Python program example functions have this sign bit, and one for loop doesn't have the sign bit, as you'll as you'll see when I get going. And each one of these things have the keyboard interrupt. Now you see how I got the stop program message, the exe. That's gonna, that's gonna make it so my interrupt vector will work, and it'll say the message. All pins are stopped. And then you got uh, are, are, are in the off state, I should say. All the, all the bits are in the off state. All the pins, everything is off. And now you got binary bits mirror. And this is going to make the bits count at the other end. They still count the right way, but as if looking in a mirror. That's amazing because shift registers, they only count from right to left. They can't do from left to right, but there is universal shift registers I've read about that can do both ways, but I haven't got the, those kind of shift registers. I only got the kind that go from right to left. And then as we get down to the other examples, 
we got bits mirror, we got binary bits mirror inverse. It's the same thing, all the lights are on, except the ones that are counting are the ones that are turning off. And it's mirror, it's also mirror. You'll see in the video also. And then we got this one down here, binary bits flow default. The binary bits are going to flow from right to left. They're not going to be inverted here. And as you can see, it's all nearly one it's all nearly sign bit it's actually up here the sign bits on here and not here it's not inverted now when i show you the next one down that's going to be inverted inverse see how that sign bits down here now instead of here and it works it's strange but it actually makes the whole thing stay inverted or and things like that and then the the one with the mirror uh see how this See how we got a, a a reverse total for loop here? That causes it to come out in mirror. That's what's making that do that. And then the same one here, this mirror, it's doing the same thing. I'm making the whole loop count backward here. Not this one. This one's doing what it has to do, a forward for a reverse for the first binary loop. And then this one down here is the forward binary loop. Now this here is the last part of the thing here. We got the least most significant bit here first, then the most significant bits. And so we got list index one and list index one. And now see how here we got no sign bit and it counts completely forward. It's a, it's a forward for loop. And this one here is a reverse for loop. So just remember that. The very first for loop is the one that's going to be negative and it's going to be the one that actually carries in the sign bit too as you, as you notice it's also carrying its sign bit that's for the actual ordinary binary bits default no special effects done to them and then this here is without the sign bit because it's doing adding the buzzards themselves they're not within the shift registers so i ain't got a control c for the buzzards to turn off so if you actually make this index that you're going to be playing with higher than five the buzzer would go and not come on and not even turn off so i had to make an interrupt vector handler for the index error overflow and uh this is pretty much it but what we're going to do is i'm going to do each program segment and then i'm just going to go like this with the with the scroll button and this, you can take the time and look at it and copy it down. Or you can go right to my community page and get the same program highlighted and copy it all. It's totally preserved. Just go to my community page on YouTube. And you'll find all this stuff. You'll find anything you want. I'm just teaching it on video so at least you'll know what you're going to get into. Instead of just seeing all this writing on my, uh, on my community page tab, at least you'll know what it kind of does. And what you might want to do with it yourselves. So what we're going to do is, so right now we're going to go like this.
Now we're going to take it to the very top and explain to you all. Now see how from time import sleep as weight? I'm using an alias here. Instead of having to type in the word time dot sleep, I just made the command shorter. I just import it from time, import sleep as weight. I can make this any word I want as long as I use that word. I call it import sleep as funny if I want. I import sleep as sleeping if I want as long as I import this as that you can actually make an alias for this you can do an alias for anything as long as you import something from something that you're looking for but it has to be that something from a function that you're looking for like there's Python functions that you get to use there's others that are pre-designed like importing sleep and such to do anything to do with time that's Python's predefined functions they're, they're what Python uses that you're allowed to have access to as a programmer. So that's what this is all about here. And then I got my GPR, my import, my GPIO, G, RPI, GP, dot GPIO as, again, I, as GPIO, okay, and then my, I got a comma separating the random numbers. I didn't really need that, actually. That was for, I think, something else I was doing at the time. But I don't really need a random in there. But I just kept that in there anyway. Sometimes I use that. But that's nothing to do with here right now. But that's nothing to work with anything right now. But as long as I use a comma, I can import on multiple lines as you see. This is a dot. This here, rpi.gpio. If I didn't want to import it as this, I would have had to use this all, all the time. It's shortened to this. That way it's one basic little easy command. And then random is random. Okay, I'm going to hide my little hand here. Take a minute to take a screenshot of this. That way you got the actual pinout drawings that look like this, that are actually this here. This is your Raspberry Pi diagram here. Okay, your little tiny Raspberry Pi. Just a little bit of a diagram of what this, these pins are here, what you're going to see here. On my breadboard and my cobbler, the way I got my cobbler, the cobbler actually shows the actual layout of the actual Raspberry Pi map here of all the GPIO pinouts. Now, in the next image, I will tell you there's two kinds of ways where the, you can use the direct GPIO to get current to go to an, to go to one of your GPIO uh, to, to go to one of your devices, or you can use the Broadcom method to indirectly call a pin. But uh, you can use it which one you wish to desire, and I'll get to that when we get to the next image. Now this here, anything that says GPIO on it, anything, all these GPIO, the word GPIO, you can use pretty much all of them. Uh, they can light up safely LEDs or anything safely that you can put to your Raspberry Pi as making your own Raspberry Pi electronic hats to make things for your Raspberry Pi, but you can use all these GPIO pins really, really safe. Okay, this would sometimes these ones here though don't like certain things though and I couldn't understand why but they do work Just that I think my LCD couldn't use this For one of these things couldn't be used for a certain item I was using but I'm not going to worry about that Just use them anyway. It says GPIO on it, right? As long as it says that you're good to go Okay, the same thing with this side you can you can use GPIOs on this side too, okay? 
So you can use anything you want on here as long as it says GPIO. Now, what you do get, you get a, you go one, two, three, four grounds that are directly current to the actual Raspberry Pi, and you get two five volt power. Okay, but don't let that fool you. This can do a lot. Okay, along with the help of your breadboard, and I'll explain this uh, as I go here. But your five volt power supply, I use this one here directly for my Raspberry Pi 4 fan because it's closest to the Raspberry Pi. This is second to the to the closest to the actual raspberry, physical Raspberry Pi itself. So what I do is I use this one here for either jumping to a positive rail on the breadboard, which is red, to give power. And then I will use one of these to jump to the breadboard to go to the negative on the blue part of the breadboard, the blue line. So you can use these to jump on the rails to, to power multiple things like multiple lights, anything you want that can safely attach to your breadboard can be powered, all these GPIO pins. All right. And now this here on your five on your right side is your five volt power supply for the Raspberry Pi, and on your three volt power supply is your your left side here. This is your left side. As if you're looking down, this is your ribbon. This would be my cobbler. As if looking right down directly at it, this here is your three point three volt side here, and uh, you get one two, three grounds, and you get one 3.3 power uh, input socket right here directly to the Raspberry Pi. But again, don't let that fool you. You can always use it either by itself or jump to the positive rail, which is red, to power to help give power to multiple things safely running on your Raspberry Pi, like LEDs and such, anything that can safely be used as a possible Raspberry Pi hat. And your same thing with your grounds. You got only three grounds on this side, but you can always jump to a power rail to run the multiple things too. And like I said before, on this side and this side, run as many things as you want, but eventually your Pi will go a little bit dim because five volts can only go so far. You know, you're going to eventually dim things down after a while if you add too much. Okay, and you will run out of pins if you add too much. Even if you have shift registers, you only get 40 pins. Okay, but anything that says GPIO on them, you can they're, they're free to use they're open season okay just uh just uh look at special words like this should there be anything that tells you what specific pins might be better for okay because like i said sometimes these ones don't work for everything for me on certain things so they might also do something else and i'm still fairly new to all this i'm only a year and a half into it so that's pretty much the layout here of the way the raspberry pi goes just keep the, a, a screenshot of this. I'll just go like this once again, and then I'll move on to what we're gonna do next. Okay, this here is a ras the Raspberry Pi 4 pinout cheat sheet chart. And then here's my little scripture again when being mindful of working with electronics. You know, there are, there are basic rules that you just cannot break. Uh, there's some there's mistakes you just cannot repair or fix should you should you ignore any basic electronics rules so you must play very close attention to this now these these here are all the gpio pinouts pins that you can use for lighting up leds or whatever devices that can safely use these gpio pins i'm pretty new to using raspberry pi i created these cheat sheets examples for quick reference and understanding of the GPIO pin layout. My first RAS Pi project will involve 10 red LEDs that will flash, flicker, and chase one another using Python. So be looking out for this. And this here was old stuff, by the way, when I, when I was explaining this part down here. I've already long since done this video here for what I was going to say, what I was going to do. I went beyond 10 LEDs, as you can see. I went to 24. So this is kind of old news here, but this is pretty much here is what I'm trying to say is standard for the Raspberry Pi, which is pretty much timeless. Okay, now the GPIO general purpose input output pinouts. These, these here are gonna be what you call directly for the pinouts. So no matter what devices you have, if you see a GPIO zero, a GPIO one, two, 
Oh, like uh, in three, but it's like she says 27. You know, that means that. Okay, the, the, if you want to use this, the direct GPL method, you're going to call these guys right here directly. Okay, number seven is GPL number four. And why they call it a different address from this one, even though it's directly to the pinout, I don't know. But anyways, this is going to be, this is referred to GPI, GPI4, GPI04, the five, six, seven, eight, nine, and so on. All these different addresses here. You use these, okay? These commented statements are just telling you what they are. That's what these are, okay? Now, if you want to turn these on and everything, use these GPIO commands to turn the GPIO pins on or off. Now, you got to use the word, the, the word high and the word low and dot, dot, okay? That turns it on, that turns it off. And whatever GPIO port you're using, seven or eight well then seven would be number four remember i just showed you seven number four this is also number four that's the direct gpio pinout right there and then it says here note make sure to turn off all gpio pins first before stopping any programs okay now this here is gpio dot cleanup releases all gpio pins which means it clears them all out make sure that it makes sure that they're in the off state that way you can pinch and poke wires whatever you have to do safely with minimal chances of electrocuting you or your pie. You must set a GPIO cleanup at the end of your programs that you ever make with your Raspberry Pi. No matter what you're doing, whether it's lights or whatever you're plugging into, always have these commands, okay? Now it says here, you can also use the Broadcom sock channel method if you prefer. This does the same thing. You can call your pins but they're not called by the actual pin itself. So this here, number zero, is referring to pin 27. Number one is referring to pin 28. And number two and then number four, see how it's the reverse here now? Number four is now pin seven. See how it's directly, indirectly calling the actual pin? And I can even understand now why the numbers are even different from seeing this correlation. Number four is indirectly now being known as pin 7 for, for the actual sock channel part of the thing. This is all commented statements again. Anything with a, a number sign, hashtag, means in Python it's a comment. I will explain the comments actually since I didn't do that. I will explain what all those com commented stuff means, so how it runs in the program and stuff. But this is also your Broadcom uh, pinout cheat sheet here. And this is how you turn these on and off. Same exact thing. See how no, GPIO4 number number four, the actual pins being called, but it's being called 28 instead or 27, whatever it was. I just looked at. What was it? I looked at again for number four, pin seven. Sorry, number four is pin seven. Okay. So you know it's really in pin seven. You're just calling it through Broadcom method. And then it says here again, note. Make sure to turn off all GPIO pins first before stopping any programs. So that's, this is very important, all right? Okay, now we're going to get to something else here. Okay, just like before, I'm going to scroll down so you can get all this cheat sheet so you can write it all down or just copy down the video and download the video and keep it as your own reference totally. But here we go. Uh... I mean, as I go down, I will explain one part I left out of this. So here we go. We're going to go like this, like this, and like this. Like that. Like this. And like this. Now this here, what I forgot to mention, See this set mode GPIO dot breadboard. This is when you want to call the pins directly. Those GPIO pinouts. This is when you want to call them directly. Okay, you gotta write this dot board. Okay, and then down here, same thing. Set mode GPIO dot BCM this time. That's for the Broadcom method. Okay, that's for when you want to call the pins indirectly. Like I said before. But I, for, I forgot to mention these, what these are here. But you must set the modes as which which uh, method you want to use. 
do you prefer to use this method bread broadcom or do you prefer to use this method board okay that means the breadboard all right I use this method all the time which one video suggests to do because it's the direct pinouts no matter where it's laid out you'll find your direct pinouts it's a lot easier apparently so I'm just using this all the time just by word of learning is all I'm doing I'm still fairly new to all this but this is the cheat sheet that I actually wrote down and made up so that we could use and this I'm gonna shortly put this on my community page prior or after I upload this video okay now what I, I'm gonna rehash some of this back up here again this 24-bit uh, blood binary counter tricks Python program examples again but this time it's not to show you the program remember in the last thing when I talked about these little hashtags these little number sign symbols well in Python or any programming languages there's a thing that's called comments now there's two types but the other the first the second type I ain't got shown here uh, and I'll explain the other type but it's just not shown here but first we'll look at these ones here what these mean is that anybody that's a programmer let's say you're working at a lab uh, computer laboratory well programmers that take over the night shift they're gonna need to know what a program is doing if they're gonna take over and continue on with the programming so the other programmer where the other programmer had left off now without any comments in the programming telling the other programmer what it's doing the program will not know what the program's supposed to be or do unless he or she runs it but they won't know what they want exactly what it's doing unless the other person fully tells them what it's doing our well, comments allow that to happen and when you run this program in your raspberry pi this whole entire program it'll run it won't run the comments that's only known to the one that created the program or the ones that get access to your program they can see these comments of what you're supposed to do what you have what you need that's what these are here these i'll explain what you need to make all this stuff work and things like that and this can run completely with the python program c plus plus basic they all have a way of making comments okay and this is the most popular one here is the hashtag and the other one not shown here the Python lights up in green I can do it live for you though I don't see why I can't I'm gonna jump this down like this and now you take three little quote marks like this and then I can go like this just to go like this to make sure I don't make an error put three more that goes back to normal again now I can write what is called a long commented paragraph I can put I love uh, this uh, this rasp uh, berry pie pie so very much you know and that stays like that and that way when you do run the program you don't have to worry about anything you can make this paragraph be as long as you want which this you can do the same but you got to keep using hashtags like you see down here with this you don't you can just go like this and you can just keep, you can just keep right on writing you can write everything you want just keep pushing return as long as you have surrounding th triple quote marks this is a long form of a comment this is called a paragraph comment okay you can write as many lines as you want in there so now we'll take this away we'll go back to the ordinary part of the programming part here we'll just go back up here a bit there we go I just wanted to make that look a little bit neater again now what I also had done remember earlier I told you about how I had a random part of the command that I didn't need well I took that away it should be right here actually where did I put all my import there we are the random was here remember so I took that away because I didn't need that but I was experimenting on something else so just a reminder that's not there now okay but everything else is normally there all right you got your import the module as uh, GPIO the modules that are functions inside them I should have said they're modules that have built-in functions inside them but they're modules okay from time that's a module import sleep as wait as I told you okay now here is uh, where I get to where I get to the variables now instead of having to type out GPIO pin one and the, the command underneath it 
uh, as I showed you in the program when you looked at it, this here makes it so it's only one command. So all you gotta do is say beep on and beep off with the exe function. These are set for the exe function. And the stop program message has been made for the control C interrupt handler, which is, what, what, this doesn't do nothing. It just says the message has stopped all the pins. But this actually acts as part of that programming statement instead of having to use a print statement, two of them, and writing all this. So I use again a exe command with one little variable right here stop program message. That way I don't got all this junk here. So the exe command is so great for doing small segments of programming. You can do for loops and everything with stuff uh, with uh, exe commands. They're really, really fun. But you've probably noticed it as you copy down that program. But uh, as for this uh, here now, we're almost coming to a complete close. I'm pretty much done here. But uh, as I said before, now you know what a comment is. And programmers have to use those in order to, uh, to uh, do what they want to do. Like more comments down here. I got more down here. Where I got to tell the user, let's say someone downloaded my program. And let's say... Uh, they didn't want to use this and they had the buzzards going and they typed in anything higher than five they could fall they could wind up in a hazard somewhere where they can't where they just don't whoa they don't know what to do so that's why i explained the cautious of this down here with through comments comments are very useful when you're programming they also make it even more useful for your own reference so you yourself knows what the program is doing especially if you walked away from it for a while you know, what you, what you don't use after a while, you'll lose. And if you don't use it for a while, you're going to lose it for a while. So it's better to have everything commented down as you're doing things with Python programming or any type of computer programming. Okay, there's another thing you should do, but I've never done it. I can't be bothered. But the right way to program a computer is first you draw yourself a flowchart. You draw little triangles and little diamond shapes and all this and that. But I, I never did flowcharts. I, I don't have, I, I do it in my head. I just do it in my head. I just basically do it that way. But to do proper programming, they say you should collaborate and do a flowchart. You know, on a blackboard or whatever. But do a, do a flowchart. But I don't follow that rule myself. I am the flowchart. That's what I tell people when they actually ask me that. I know all about it, but I can't be bothered with that. I just see it in my head and do it like a musician. I just see it all in my head. I just go nuts and go do it. But this here is very important to have comments. That way, those, even you who write down this program of mine, will know what it's doing. But you don't have to remove any of these comments. They run with the program, all right? All you do is copy everything down. I will soon put this on my, uh, I actually do got this on my uh, uh, the community tab on YouTube. So it's already there. But the only thing you're going to see is that word random. But you, that, remember, that does nothing, okay? I was using that for another project. But it doesn't harm the program that you're using. So you can leave it if you want. I don't know. I'll play with random binary bits. Use it for that. But that's an import module. So if you want to use the random, you have to say You have to have that random module there. Okay? I just didn't call it as something. I didn't use an alias. I just left it as random. Okay? That's all I left that as. Just a, the plain module that you just use. Okay, so this pretty much sums this part up here. All right, guys, it's about the end of the show here. I just want to say a quick, uh, a quick goodbye for now, and I thank you for taking the time to watch and learn about this. The raspberry pies are very fascinating, and as for this project, I'm done. <laughs>